one. And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle update. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Dan Ahrens, who's Managing Director and Portfolio Manager at Advisor Shares with approximately 1.5 billion in assets under management. And Dan runs a lot of ETFs. He wrote a great book, which is called Investing Advice. Dan, without further ado, the floor is yours. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Adam. It's uh, nice to talk to you and your audience. Thank you. So Dan, I always like to begin uh, with the story. Can you tell us how you got to where you are today, please? Ah, that's a, um, a little bit of a long and complicated path, but um, um, I'll say back in around 2000, back at the end of 1999, working for another firm, um, we were managing funds and portfolios, always looking at different industries, different sectors. And around that time, if people are old enough to remember, uh, technology fell off a cliff after a big run up. And we noticed looking at industry rankings, some certain industries that suddenly we're at the very top for one year, three year, five year, 10 year performance. And it was an interesting subset of industries, alcohol, gaming, tobacco. I think you're sensing a theme here. Vice. And <laughs> actually got the idea to create, um, after a lot of back and forth discussion, a vice mutual fund. So there's actually a mutual fund in existence called the Vice Fund. Um, I managed it for its first three years um, with a very good track record. I left that fund uh, ranked in the top one, two, three percent in its lipper categories. It became a five-star rated mutual fund, and it really focused on alcohol, tobacco, gaming, even uh, you know defense and weapons. We got in a lot of uh, discussions with other funds about the whole. Back then, they called it socially responsible investing. You know, now it's more often called uh, um, ESG. Well, yeah, ESG, and it's been through a bunch of different uh, iterations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, now I'm at another firm, <laughs> Advisor Shares Investments. We do all ETFs, but um, we always thought in the back of our minds we might create a vice fund at some point. And now we do have a VICE ETF, got a great ticker, V-I-C-E, VICE. Um, but we actually got into VICE um, at the same time we were looking at cannabis investments. And we also have become a well-known shop for having um, the world's largest cannabis ETFs. We have a, um, a handful of them. But uh, an important thing about VICE, um, we can discuss uh, the pros and cons all day long of people's uh, political and moral views, but no matter what's going on in the economy, no matter what's going on in the stock market, no matter what's going on with recession interest rates, people are going to do certain things. And I like to look at consumer staples quite often. Um, I like to look at certain industries, certain sectors that people are going to spend money on or consume or continue to use in some form or fashion, no matter what's going on. And that's kind of the theme behind Vice and some of the other funds that uh, we have here at Advisor Shares. I love it. Well, congratulations on the wild success and, and multiple ETFs here. I know you have a hotel ETF. You've got a restaurant ETF. You've got so many, a cannabis ETF, the Vice ETF, um, and, and a lot more. So let's talk about your investment strategy, Dan. How do you see the world? And how, talk a little about your fundamental, more technical. How do you approach the whole investment theme? No, great great question. And with uh, the fun names that you dropped, people might think, oh, those guys that advise your shares only do uh, you know industry and thematic funds. But uh, Advisor Shares has more than 20 funds. A, a number of those funds are sub-advised with other investment advisors that are specialists in certain areas. We have bond funds. We have large cap growth funds. We have some very good sub-advisors working in different areas. But funds that we um, have done here internally at Advisor Shares um, with, with me as the portfolio manager are thematic. And what I like about a thematic fund 
especially in the ETF space, is it fills a need if investors or investment advisors want to use that particular industry as part of their overall portfolio. Uh, I think it's very important for investors to know what they're investing in and understand what they're investing in. And if there's a fund called the Advisor Shares Hotels ETF, I think by law, or by regulation, <laughs> it has to have at least 80% of its assets in hotels, in the hotel right. industry. So it's something that people can know and understand and relate to. So first of all, for a thematic fund, that's it. Another part of an ETF, an exchange-traded fund, is transparency. And I think that's another important thing for an investor. Every single business day, they can look at the website and they can see all the holdings of a fund. It's very important to understand what you are invested in. That's a good tool for an investment advisor. That's a good tool for an individual investor. Understand what you're investing in. Look at the holdings. <laughs> Does it make sense to you? And... Um, so here at Advisor Shares and what I do, again, that's the first piece. Another piece is that everything we do here at Advisor Shares is actively managed. Now, there are some misconceptions about what is actively managed. Actively managed simply means it's not an index. It's not tied to a index. More often, indexes are market cap weighted. If we're talking about an industry or a certain sector, some of those largest companies might not be the best investments in that industry. Right. So all we're doing is using some means to select the companies, the stocks that we want to be most invested in, the companies that we want to weight the heaviest, the companies that we want to underweight, or the companies that we might want to avoid completely, or depending on certain criteria, add to the portfolio at any given time. So... Actively managed does not mean overly active. It doesn't mean it's, if it says in the prospectus that it's a tactical fund that is meant to use, you know, tactical signals to move in and out of things, then it's a tactical fund. That's nothing to do with active per se. Um, I think a fund should not be overly active. It's very important um, to, to mind your tax efficiency, to manage your, your turnover rates, your transactional fees. All these things can be bad. Um, so actively managed portfolios, we think are very important. That simply means we get to underweight, overweight, avoid stocks. And on that note, we are attempting to add alpha to a portfolio. We're attempting to do better than what an index would do whether it's an index of hotels, whether it's an index of vice stocks, which doesn't actually exist. <laughs> uh, the index, I mean, there's, right. there's not a... Yet. Um, <laughs> Yet. <laughs> there might be a few random, arbitrary, small indexes out there, but they're not widely known like the S&P 500. Right. Um, or whether it's an index of cannabis stocks and, and those things you know, do exist. So um, attempting to add some... Um, oomph to the portfolio, some alpha to the portfolio by picking stocks, trying to avoid landmines. Um, there's no crystal ball. There's no uh, magic formula. But more often than not, we want to manage risk. We want to add some alpha to a portfolio. We want to just simply try to select the best stocks within the criteria that we're given in our prospectus, within the rules that are given to us in, in an investment company, that's uh, within the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ's rules, all those things. But um, the investment strategy is picking the best stocks within that from whatever I, I, criteria. I love that. Also yeah. part of your question. Yeah. I managed a couple different funds in different ways. And if we're talking about a vice portfolio, a hotel's portfolio, a restaurant's portfolio, um. There is a little bit of secret sauce, but I do rely heavily on outside analysts. When you're working in a certain industry, you get to know which are the analysts that are high rated and accurate, um, the ones that are uh, trustworthy, and the other analysts that I choose to ignore. 
And I very often look for outside analyst ratings. I look for earnings revisions. If an analyst is increasing their quarterly or annual earnings estimates for a company, that's a good thing. <laughs> they're, they're, they're raising their estimates. They're thinking this company might do better than the previous numbers. We rate that very high. So again, there's some secret sauce. There's some different criteria that we use in screening, scanning for stocks from a couple different sources, a couple different programs that we, we focus on. And we're looking for outside analyst revisions, outside analyst ratings, and then managing the portfolio from there. As I say that, we also, working in a certain industry, and this affects us more in the cannabis space, but also the hotel, restaurant, vice spaces, it's a defined universe. It's a fairly small universe of stocks. So you get to know those companies and you consume information from all their earnings announcements, their earnings calls, actually communicate with the top executives at those companies. And um, so there's an awful lot of fundamental information and communication if you're looking at a defined group of stocks. And it's a very different animal than a fund, for instance, that's looking at the Russell 3000 and using certain criteria to select what their criteria thinks are the best stocks within the Russell 3000. That's a huge universe of stocks, and it better be very quantitative. On the funds we manage, I said we're using certain analyst ratings and our analyst information, but more than that, we are fundamentally knowing the companies that we're investing in. I'm going to go into Peter Lynch here and say, invest in what you know and invest in what you understand. Right. It's uh, paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, you can do that in certain industries. I love that. So that's a really good point you make between the difference in tactical and active. I love that. I love the fact that you look at the fundamentals, you know your company as well. You look at the analyst ratings and you, you want to see companies on, on, if possible, that are growing and analyst estimates are going up. That's always yeah. a good thing. Um, let's talk about risk, Dan. How do you handle risk and what mistakes do you see people make with respect to risk management? Um, the simplest thing, well, a couple of different parts here. Individual investors chasing after hot returns, not having an overall plan. That, that, that's it. Um, especially in this day and age with the increase in information, information overload, you know, e even on Twitter. Now, Twitter's great for uh, breaking news. It's the first place to see a lot of news very often, but it's also a cesspool of misinformation. And especially when you get into stocks, ah, there's, um, there's a lot of ugliness out there. Um, you know, beating up people for uh, when stocks go down and a lot of people pumping and wishing they were in whatever's the hottest stocks out there. Now, another, you know, misunderstanding about risk is there's risk in a fund and then there's risk in a individual or a firm or an advisor's overall portfolio. So, ETFs, exchange-traded funds, are meant to be tools. They're meant to be a piece of the portfolio. What I said earlier is, you know, this fund is not meant to be tactical. It's not, if it says it's perspective, it's a, a prospectus, it's a tactical fund, yeah, then it might tactically move to cash. It might get certain signals to get out of its hotels investments or get out of its cannabis investments. But most funds and the funds that I manage, that's not part of their mandate. It's not part of their prospectus. The, the prospectus says that it's going to be at least 80%. And again, it's usually closer to 100% invested in the sector or industry that it's meant to be invested in. Investors or advisors should use that portfolio, that fund, as part of their overall portfolio. And they should have risk management and a plan ahead of time for their overall investments. And you know that ETF should be one piece of the pie. Um, now, most funds do have some risk management inside of them. I am constantly in my job looking at position sizes. 
at um, overall, um, you know, portfolio makeup. And I'm going to give you a good example of um, hotels. It's not only picking stocks in portfolio, but it's also directly risk management that a year and a half ago, we were invested in travel and leisure type of, of hotel stocks, um, personal travel, avoiding the biggest names and the biggest business related hotel stocks. In the last year to nine months, we've changed that. Um, instead of just leisure travel and also regional casinos, local market casinos, that those were all doing fine during COVID and leisure travel was the first to recover from COVID. In the past year, business travel has come back in a really big way. Mm -hmm. And our portfolio has moved into the biggest hotel chains, heavier, Hyatt, Marriott, Hilton, uh, IHG, and um, much more of a balance between the business travel and the leisure travel. That's just an example. In um, our vice-oriented portfolio, we're also um, moving back and forth at different times. And in the past uh, six months, we've moved heavier back into big beer, especially international big beer. Um, two years ago, big beer was very out of, uh, it, it wasn't ideal. Everybody was looking at craft beer, craft liquors, high-end liquors. Big beer was, um, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, it was lagging. It was lagging. It was um, out of, it, it wasn't popular. Now it's come back in a big way. And the thought is with a vice portfolio, again, recession resistant, market resistant, no matter what's going on in the economy, we don't really know if we're going into a recession right now, or we're already in a recession right now. But uh, beer is sure, steady, dependable. And uh, some people are dialing down um, because of inflation, their alcohol spending. So um, again, very different animals, what should be done in a portfolio, a single fund, mm -hmm. or an individual or advisor's overall portfolio for risk management. Now, that's a really good point. So um, with the stocks in your fund, do you use stops to exit as far as entry to exit? Or is it just, hey, listen, if it's undervalued, it's just going down, you, buy, you average down and buy more if you still believe in the theme? Or how would you approach approach that? Because, like you said, hotel stocks, beds is you know tickers B E D Z. Okay, it has to invest in hotel stocks. It's not like the Russell three thousand or the Nasdaq one hundred where you have a bigger universe. What do you do here? Where with managing risk, is it just is it more of a longer term play? Because like the vice it's ETF a, yep. you have is doing great. So you know a lot of these they they ebb and flow based on the uh, environment. Yeah. No. Great question. And again, it goes to an investor should understand and know what they're investing in. Okay. And that means reading the prospectus like you're supposed to do and looking at the other funds marketing materials. So yes. there are funds out there that say they're going to have a very certain position size. Or there's funds that say they're going to rebalance every month. There's funds that say they're going to rebalance every quarter. An investor should know that. If they're putting yeah. money in a particular mutual fund or ETF, whatever it is, they should know that information. What is this fund using? What are their stops? Do they have certain position sizes that are part of their uh, usual investment mandate? Now, yeah. in the funds I'm managing, I do not. I do not like having a fixed rebalance schedule or even a fixed rebalance size. Now, I am mandated by the investment company rule of 1940 and internal revenue code limits and the SEC and a few other things about position sizes and concentration and diversification. But besides that, I don't put constraints on the portfolio, except I'm constantly managing it, not overly managing it because it's a very long term focus. Right. right. We try not to have too much turnover but on any <clears throat> given day. Mm -hmm. And also as a result of certain market movements we see on any given day. Yeah. If I see a stock that's up 15%, I might choose to go in and trim it just because it's up so darn much. 
Yeah. Um, if I see a stock that's down 20%, well, that's going to make me take a deeper dive. <laughs> I'm gonna right. say, What's going on? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And pretty often, while there could be a little bit of bad news, it could be a market overreaction in the short term. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's hard to say that in a vacuum that I'm always going to buy something that's down 20% or sell something that's up 20%. Right. But um, I might take advantage of those um, changes. I'm not turning over the portfolio entirely. I'd call it a nip and a tuck. Yeah. Um, but um, I might take advantage of some trading opportunities like that and hopefully add a little alpha to the portfolio. And those are the type of things that people might not even see, but um, long-term focus with daily watching the fund. Love it. So Dan, let's shift gears a little bit. Thank you for that, by the way. Let's talk about some timeless lessons and timeless mistakes you've learned along the way, please. I'm going to go back to something I think I already mentioned a little bit, but it's chasing the hot dot. It's um, investors being short-sighted. Uh, it's investors uh, getting into uh, stocks that are, again, the word hot, the stocks that have gone up the most. And especially with what happens out there in, with, with the internet now, with Twitter information, with what's going on, people have lost the art to a large extent of buying what's on sale, of buying stocks that are out of favor. Now, what usually happens if you're long-term focused is stocks that are out of favor come back into favor. Stocks that were hot, let's talk about FANG. <laughs> Facebook, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, not Alibaba, Netflix, but um, Google. Yeah, Netflix, Netflix, Google. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was virtually impossible just a few short years ago to outperform them. Mm -hmm. And they made up such a huge part of the S&P 500 that it was virtually impossible to beat the S&P 500. Right. And um, my, how things change um, in a short period of time, uh, but they always do. And, do. and those are things that investors should remember. If value is out of favor, it's going to come back into favor. And, yep. um, you, you know, it's called a, a re revision to the mean. Yeah. So when sh when small caps are, are out of favor and large caps are outperforming, I can't say when. And people should not try to listen to prognosticators give their big predictions about when. It may take a while, but things will always revert to the mean and sectors and industries that are out of favor will come back into favor and, and vice versa. Uh, Whatever is hot, the hottest stocks, the hottest industries, the hottest sectors, they're not going to stay that way. Right. And too many, um, even when we look at flows on um, our, our, our largest funds, a cannabis fund, the biggest inflows came when cannabis was really hot near the top. Right. And uh, sometimes, uh, and, and cannabis has been bad for a solid two years now as we wait on you know federal legislation, federal reform that's been promised. And, um, you know, sometimes people get out at the bottom. So those are the lessons. Don't chase what's hot. Long-term focus. Remember that things that are out of favor are going to come back into favor and the opposite. Revision to the mean. And that's a, that's a really lost art and a lost conversation when people are chasing hot things. Yeah, no, I love that. It's funny because this is our first time meeting, but a lot of what you share, I've learned as well. I wrote in my book, it's called Psychological Analysis. It was number one on Amazon for about two months. And I have what's called the one second rule. So you ever do something and then you kind of give up, but had you continued for one second longer, not literally, but probably it would have worked like a red light. You kind of at the red light, you know, it's going to turn green, but you just can't take it anymore. You put the car in park and then bam, it turns green like almost one second later. That's just a silly example. It's the same thing with the market where you're like, you're saying now would be the time to get into the cannabis because now is the time, you know, that it's red before it's going to go green. You know, it's going to turn, but yeah. people tend to chase it. They're getting in when it's green, when the next thing it's going to do is go yellow and then red. So yeah, and the only that, thing I can't right. say is, is when I absolutely yeah. can't say when I never right. try to. <laughs> right. No, that's really, really good. So uh, Dan, you've been in the business for a long time. You've done a lot of great things a pioneer in many, many respects. What's some uh, advice you give new investors or money managers looking to enter the space? Well, investors or money managers are two very different things. <laughs> so um, 
but it's to have a plan. It's to have a, have a long-term plan. Um, and, and, and do all your research for, for a lot of individual investors. Uh, again, first of all, I'd say get an investment advisor. Um, don't listen to, uh, the Twitter sphere and, uh, the so-called experts of who knows who they really are, what their expertise really is. And, um, you know, have a long-term plan. How about, how about, here's a good one. Study, study the greats of mm. going back, uh, you know, old school study Warren Buffett. No, he's not out of touch. He, yeah. he, he keeps, uh, he has long-term focus and he keeps succeeding. Um, Peter Lynch, um, you know, more investors need to go back and, and study some of those uh, old school greats and um, for sage investment advice as comparing to uh, everything that's out there on the internet right now is all about um, momentum <laughs> and um, uh that's what's taught in a lot of the online trading classes out there. Um, and more often people are going to get burnt. Got it. I love it. And then finally, what's the best piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience? See, that was a question that you gave me before we were talking. Most of this talk was on the fly, but yeah. um, so, so I had to think about that and look, and I'm going to go back to um, um, Warren Buffett. Now, a lot of people have already heard um Attempt to be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Now, that's a great quote. A lot of people know, but I'm going to give you a different one. So Please. The different one is um, the most important quality for an investor is temperament. Nice. You need a temperament that neither derives great pleasure from being with the crowd or against the crowd. And I think that's very fitting for what's going on in the investment world right now with a lot of the uh, Twitter followers and everything else. It's right down the middle. There's a bunch of people that derive great pleasure from being with the crowd. And there's others that are absolutely deriving pleasure from being against the crowd. I'm going to give you a standing ovation. Both. Standing ovation for that one. I love that. That's absolutely brilliant. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Um, advisorshares.com it's not uh it's not difficult as i said all of our funds are on our website all of our daily holdings are on the website and even my contact information's on the website and uh, you know a couple other executives but uh advisorshares.com and um we like to do a lot of education a lot of communication uh people that go to our website will even see that we do a daily live stream every day at noon the alpha nooner with different guests. So uh, everybody take a look. We try to communicate a lot. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Have a great day.